Welcome to the uh, multi-party computation one session. Uh, the first uh, talk in this session would be about randomized functions with how to run complexity by uh, uh, Saguata Basu, Hamidoza, Amini, Koagsani, Amata Maji, and Hai Nguyen, and Hai will give the talk. Um, thank you for the introductions. Um, I'm talking about randomized functions with high round complexity. And this is joint work with uh, Basu, Maji, and Hamid. So let me start with uh, introducing the model. So we study round complexity of secure computations in information theoretic plane model. So in this model, at least have a private input X and both have private input Y. And their objective is to sample the same output z from the distributions f of x y. So the two parties has unbounded computational power. They honestly follow the protocol, but curious to obtain additional information about uh, the other party private inputs. So parties also allow to speak in rounds over an ideal communication channel. So we are interested in the raw complexities of securely computing the given function f. So let me summarize the current state of the art. So if we are in the uh, setting without security, then any functions can be computed in two routes. Uh, it's very simple. Alice sends her inputs to Bob, then Bob samples the outputs from the distributions, then Bob sends the output back to Alice. So now consider the setting where we consider um, semi-honest security. So first, we have to, uh, we look at the class of functions. Uh, they are deterministic. So for this, uh, in the similar work by Shaw, Kusilevis, and Beaver, um, they characterize the set of all the functions that have a secure protocol. So in particular, n is uh, deterministic deterministic decomposable functions has raw complexity as most uh, this number, that number, okay. And uh, what about for the randomized functions? So for um, randomized functions, uh, data programs characterized for a, a particular a set of functions. Those functions have tenary outputs, and the um, upper bound on the raw complexities is two. So the question remains open for um, general randomized functions. So we observe that um, in all three rows here, the raw complexities it depends only on the size of the inputs and output alphabets. And it's in, in, independent of the probability distributions uh, describing the function f. Therefore, it is natural to conjecture that um, this is also true for arbitrary randomized functions. And here's our contributions. Uh, somehow surprising this, we uh, show that this conjecture is false. In particular, for any natural number r, we construct a function with binary inputs and with five output alphabets so that the raw complexities is equal to r. So the raw complexities must involve the probability describing the function f. And we also saw that our construction is optimal. So for any functions uh, with binary inputs, and with output alphabet of size as most four, the raw complexity is e at most four. So our result indicates that um, the randomized functions computation landscape is very complicated, and um, a lot of uh, secure computation techniques might be unknown to us. 
and so it be on our intuitions and imaginations. So we also discover a uh, fascinating connections between CQ computations and hydrodynamics. So we uh, learn about these connections in an uh, algebraic geometry workshop. And let me give you some intuition here. So first, the CQ computation problems is closely related to the nomination hole. Um, that is parameterized by two parameters, the lambda and the set of initial points. And from the set of initial points, we recursively construct a sequence of sets. And here's the constructions. We don't need to get to, uh, we don't need to know exactly how, sorry, how the set is constructed. And the lamination house is the limits of the, the sequence of sets. And the raw complexity problems is uh, in which lambda is special sets, where the first coordinates and the second coordinates is, uh, uh, is zero. So finding the nomination house is tied to computing the stationary solutions of some differential equations. And um, that is IPM equations that you can see here. So again, it's not important to understand the equations. So the point that um, it might be the case that secure computation protocols manifest in physical processes in nature. So for the rest of the talk, I will give some uh, high level overview of our um, constructions. So our constructions is based on um, some uh, framework developed by the same set of author last year. So in uh, this, we reduce the raw complexity problem to a geometric problem. So every function is encoded at the triplets uh, in a high dimensional, high dimensional space. It encodes at least marginal distributions, both marginal distributions and uh, the function encoding. And we have rules for bonding. We can convert this combined two points. If the first coordinates are the same or the second coordinates are the same. And for the base case, the initial set S0 is a set of all the unsplit monochromatic rectangles. And the size of the set equal to the size of the output alphabets. And uh, the geometric actions, it recursively constructs the set SI plus one from SI. So SI plus one is a set of all convex combinations of points in SI that satisfy the rule of bonding. And the raw complexity is reduced to um, membership testing. In particular, the raw complexity of the functions is less than or equal to R if and only if the credit points is in the set SR. So as a consequence, um, the raw complexity is exactly equal to R if and only if the credit point in SR, but not in SR minus one. So using this um, results, our constructions is entirely geometry. So let me recall our objective here. Uh, for every natural number R, we want to construct a functions with binary inputs and five output alphabets, so that the raw complexity of these functions is equal to R. And following the reductions, um, it suffices to construct functions so that the credit point is in SR and not in SR minus one. So here's our main idea. We construct a set S0 of constant size in an ambient space of constant dimensions so that the sequence of sets S0, S1 they're not stabilized. What I mean is that um, S0 is not a strict subset of S1 and so on and so forth. So why we need this? Because if this sequence of sets stabilizes, then um, the raw complexity is bounded. Okay. And here's our um, um, example. We start with a set S0, have five points in uh, 3D. And um, this is the data square uh, example. And here we represent the first two coordinates of D points using the 
uh, x and y axis. And for the third coordinate, we use the um, cycle as a circle to represent it. And the fractions of the red areas represent the third coordinate. For example, for all four points, A, B, C, and D, the third coordinate is zero. So the, the red areas, uh, the fraction of the red areas is zero. But for point E, the third coordinate is one. So the fractions of uh, red areas is one. So the entire uh, circle. Now following the rule of bonding, we can combine two points B and E. They are x axis aligned or horizontally aligned. So we can add the midpoint of B and E to the set S1. So for this point, the term, a fraction of red areas is half. And for S2, we can do uh, similar. Really. Um, we can combine C and the new boy added to S1 because they are uh, vertically aligned. So we added the midpoint of the, the two points. Now the, red, uh, the fraction of red areas is one fourth. And we keep doing that from the new point with D and we get a new point in S3. And now the fraction of red areas is one by eight. And so on, um, we have new point. The fraction of area is one by 16. And if we do it one more step, then um, the fraction of red areas is one by 32. So we keep doing it like that. So let me summarize what we do so far. So we constructed a sequence uh, of points in R3. So that's the third coordinate be decreases. It is one by two to the i. And this tend to zero, but it never reaches zero. So we have an infinite sequence of points. So that's why um, we, uh, we achieve our objective. And a remark here is that this example is similar to the famous uh, Tata Square in uh, mathematics. And we learned about this uh, earlier this year in the um, workshop. So now using that example, uh, we can construct the functions uh, as follow. And here is the closed form expression of the functions. And actually we have to leave it up from the uh, 3D dimensions to seven dimensional space. Because the set of initial points are not corresponding to any functions. But the idea is simple. Um, so initial set of points still five points. And actually the, the last coordinates of the new S0 is same as the, the third coordinates in the 3D dimensions. Okay. So for, for this, we also construct uh, the query points and show that it is in SF4K plus one and in not in the set S4K. And here we show the constructions for um, 4K minus one, uh, 4K plus one and other um, 4K plus two, plus three and plus zero is constructed similarly. Okay. So in conclusions, we um, construct functions, randomized functions with high route complexities. Um, the functions are simple with binary inputs and with five output alphabets. And our constructions are optimal. And one open question um, is that um, does a two-party randomized functions have a secure protocol? This question uh, remain open. And the corresponding uh, nomination hole problems is an open problem in algebraic geometry. And that question is recently proposed in the workshop. And in an ongoing work, uh, we show that uh, the questions, this problem is decidable. And the technical ideas we use is using tropical geometry. And uh, thank you for the attention. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Questions? Um, this is a kind of non-technical question. Um, so the 
it's in very interesting that there was a parallel between secure computation and fluid dynamics. And I'm sure there are a lot of parallels out there in, you know, a, with a lot of different fields, but it's often very difficult to find those parallels because the experts in one field are not going to be experts in another field. So I'm curious in your case, was there someone who already knew about fluid dynamics or how did you get that expertise from a very different field to know that there was a connection? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I believe that's all of us not really familiar with uh, fluid dynamics. Um, one of the authors, um, um, Professor Basu, is um, uh, working in algebraic geometry, and in, he's organized a workshop in that uh, topic. And in that workshop, uh, some other experts in that field, they see the program, they know the connection between um, fluid dynamic and AG code. Uh, AG, um, algebraic geometry in general, and we have the connection between um, secure computation and nomination holes and nomination hole to the fluid uh, problem. So that's why we see the connections. Take the rest of the questions offline. I need to move to the next uh, talk. So let's uh, thank Hai again. The next talk is on the round complexity of fully secure solitary MPC with honest majority by Sai Krishna Badrinan Payomiao Patyai Mukherji and Divya Ravi and Divya will give the talk. Um, hello, everyone. So this talk is about the round complexity of fully secure solitary MPC based on a joint work with uh, Sai Krishna, Pehan, and Pratya. So this is an MPC session. We know that this is a technique to allow a, a group of parties to securely compute a joint function on their private inputs. Now, solitary MPC is just a special case of standard MPC. But in this special case, you are trying to compute functions where the output is supposed to be obtained by a unique designated party. And uh, we are trying to understand if you want to compute functions of this kind, if we can do better in terms of feasibility and efficiency as compared to standard MPC protocols where everyone gets the output. So this, uh, trying to understand whether there's a gap between these two notions, uh, in terms of feasibility between standard and solitary MPC, this is something that has only recently started being explored. For instance, there is this classic impossibility result by Cleave, which says that the strongest notion of full security or guaranteed output delivery, where no matter what the adversary does, he cannot prevent the honest parties from obtaining the output. So it has been known since quite a long time now that this is impossible in case of dishonest majority. And this had been studied for the case of standard MPC. And uh, what Halevi and others showed in a recent work is that even if the function is in a way that only one party is supposed to get the output, still this impossibility holds and you cannot get a GOD in dishonest majority. So what this means is that if we still want to aim for this uh, strongest notion, we will need to look at honest majority. And further, it's known from existing results that you would have to assume either the presence of a broadcast or a public key infrastructure. So now let's focus on the round complexity of protocols achieving GOD in honest majority. Now say that you have both broadcast as well as PKI, then two rounds are known already to be necessary and sufficient in both the standard case where everyone gets the output as well as the solitary case. And the focus of our work was to try to understand if we remove one of these two assumptions, then what happens to the round complexity landscape? So say we begin with the setting where you have broadcast, but we remove the PKI, then what happens? So for the case of standard MPC, three rounds was already known to be necessary and sufficient in this setting for GOD. And we wanted to see if we can do better in case of solitary MPC. And in our work, we actually have a negative result because we showed that three rounds continues 
to remain necessary to get GOD in this setting, even in the case of solitary MPC. So we show the lower bound for these three rounds, uh, but the upper bound follows from the upper bound for standard MPC, because standard MPC implies solitary MPC. Uh, another contribution that we had is that these three round upper bounds, they actually use broadcast in all the three rounds. So we also had another contribution trying to understand the optimal use of broadcast. And we showed that broadcast is necessary among these three rounds, it's necessary only in the first two rounds, but it can be avoided in the last round. So that's about the setting where you have broadcast, but you don't have a PKI. Now let's move on to the setting where you have a PKI, but you don't have broadcast. And in the case of standard MPC, it's already known that T plus one rounds are actually necessary to design such a protocol with GOD. Here T is the number of corruptions. So what this basically means is that you cannot get constant round protocols with GOD in case of standard MPC. And we want to see if we can do better in the solitary case. And here we had a positive result because here it turns out that you can in fact design constant round protocols. And we showed a five round construction. And uh, we also have a lower bound showing that four rounds are necessary. So you see that there is a one round gap and this is still open about whether the optimal complexity is four or five in this case. And I must comment that in our lower bound, it holds only if you assume you have at least three corruptions and the landscape is slightly different in the special cases when you have only one or two corruptions, but I will refer you to the paper for our results related to these special cases. So this is basically a summary of our results. And for the rest of the talk, I want to give you the design of this five round construction. So let's now only think about the setting where you have a PKI, but you don't have broadcast. And uh, we want to design this five round upper bound for GOD in solitary MPC. Uh, our approach is that we actually begin with the two round protocol of Gordon and others. And this was a standard MPC protocol giving output to everyone. And it uses both PKI and broadcast. So let's start with this and then try to remove broadcast from this. So they actually rely on this tool called decentralized threshold fully homomorphic encryption. So here, as a part of this special PKI setup, the, everyone has access to this public key, but the secret key is shared among the parties. So for simplicity, I'm showing you here the design for three parties with one corruption, but it's generalizable to any honest majority setting. So now assuming that the parties already have this as a part of the setup, what they do in their first round is that parties use the public key to compute an encryption of their inputs. And in the first round, they broadcast these input ciphertexts. And now once you have done this, due to the homomorphic property, anyone can locally compute on these input ciphertexts to get the output ciphertext, which is nothing but the encryption of the output. And now once this is done in the second round, what every party does is that he uses his share of the secret key to partially decrypt this output ciphertext. And, and the second round is basically the broadcast of these partial decryptions. Now, um, the threshold property of this scheme is that if you combine P plus one of these partial decryptions, then the decryption would actually work and you can uh, get the output. So intuitively why this gives GOD is because if the corrupt party does not cooperate in giving his partial decryption, the remaining parties are still enough for you to get the output. So let's begin with this and we want to try to remove the broadcast. And let's uh, start with the second round because that's simpler. And since we are in the solitary case where we only want this designated party Q to get the output, it's easy to remove broadcast in the second round. And you can just make the um, party send this partial decryptions over point to point channel to Q. That should be enough for Q to get the output. So getting rid of the broadcast in the second round is really straightforward. Now let's move on to the first round and understand what happens if uh, these input ciphertexts were exchanged over point-to-point -point channel instead. Then what a corrupt P1 could do is he could compute an encryption of a different input and send it to P2. And now the problem would be that these two honest parties, P2 and Q, they have a different view of the input ciphertexts. So they would come up with a different output ciphertexts and their partial decryptions would not be aligned with respect to the same set of inputs. So no matter what, we need to make sure that the honest parties are agreeing on the same set of input ciphertext. So it seems that you would need something like broadcast 
to for them to agree and but broadcast is known to require t plus one rounds so it seems that we are again heading towards this non-constant round barrier but the way that uh, saves us is uh, what we focus on is that we are in the solitary case and we are only concerned about an honest q getting the output so we want the honest parties to agree as long as q is honest if q is corrupt we don't mind if the honest parties realize that they're not agreeing and they abort. So the idea is to kind of use an honest queue to emulate this effect of having a broadcast. So for instance, if somebody already told me in advance that queue is honest, then what I could do is I could make these parties send these input ciphertexts over point-to-point -point channel to queue and then make queue forward it back the set of input ciphertext to everyone. And I can do this and the honest because the honest queue will definitely distribute consistent information when he's asked to. So the honest queue is kind of emulating this broadcast effect. And then if if we do that, then as before, we could uh, send the partial decryptions in the end. And this three rounds would actually work if we knew that queue was honest. But of course, we don't know that and queue might be corrupt. So what we need to do is make sure that a corrupt queue uh, cannot do any harm, and in particular, he cannot get multiple evaluations of the function with respect to different set of inputs. So a corrupt queue, how would he try to get multiple evaluations? He, he would try to get it by changing either the input of other parties or changing his own input. Now we can make sure by using signatures that uh, by making people sign on their input ciphertexts, we can make sure that the corrupt queue cannot uh, change the input on behalf of honest parties. But with respect to his own input, he could still, for example, have two versions of his own input ciphertext, and he could sign both of them and send it to two different parties. So to make sure that he doesn't do this change with respect to his own input, we make the parties uh, exchange the information in the next round among themselves and cross-check that there does not exist two input ciphertexts from Q with both valid signatures. So these measures already take care of uh, making sure that Q can in some way not play around with his own input nor with other parties' inputs. But what he can still do is, for instance, he could tell uh, P2 that P1 sent him nothing. And from the point of view of P2, he does not know if Q is lying or P1 is in fact corrupt and uh, indeed did not send the input ciphertext to Q. So this kind of situations are problematic because you can never prove that you got nothing from another person over a point-to-point -point channel. So the way that we fix this is by having another round in the beginning where the parties are exchanging the input ciphertext. And once they do that, instead of sending just their own ciphertext, we make them uh, echo whatever they got in the first round to Q. And in the third round, when Q is forwarding this set of encryptions, uh, we demand that he should include a party's input ciphertext, not only if he got it directly from them in the first round, but we force him to include it, even if he has got it indirectly through a different party in the second round. And why this helps is because of the kind of situation we saw earlier. Take, for example, that P2 had seen a ciphertext from P1, uh, so he would have forwarded it to Q in the second round. And now Q cannot claim anymore that he has no ciphertext from P1 because P2 has sent a version of it to him. So this condition is the part that ensures that uh, P2 will not be confused anymore and would not feel obliged to help an honest Q because he would see that Q is including whatever at least he has forwarded. So this is kind of uh, the main idea, like the main design of our five round upper bound. Um, so to summarize, basically in this work, we looked at round complexity of solitary MPC with GOD, and we looked at what happens if we remove one among PKI or broadcast, but uh, not we don't have both. And we looked at the ideas of the five round construction. And for the other results, I would refer you to look at the paper. Thank you for listening. Questions? Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Okay.
the next talk is uh, on secure comp computation of solitary output functionalities with and without broadcast by Bar Alon and Eran Omri. And Bar will give the talk. Thank you. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about secure computation uh, of solitary output functionalities with and without broadcast. And this is a joint work with Eran Omri. So solitary output uh, computation was first defined by Alevi, Shai Kushilevitz, Mokirianis, and Rabin. And in these settings, the set of parties wish to compute some function in such a way that only one party obtained the output. So for example, you can consider a server that uh, wants to do some analysis over its user's data. And we want to, that only the server to obtain the output. And we want to maintain some security properties such as correctness, or we want to maintain the privacy of the user's inputs. And maybe we even want to guarantee output delivery, meaning that if the server is honest, then it will always get the output. And this should hold even if some of the users are uh, malicious and are trying to disrupt the computation. So what do we know? Uh, what do we already know? So the famous result by Godrach, Mikali, and Vigdorsson, they showed that assuming there is an honest majority, then every function can be securely computed, uh, even, if, even without solitary output functionality. However, there is the hidden assumption that there is a broadcast channel available to the parties, meaning that every party can send the same message to all of the other parties. But this assumption, uh, this, we have two assumptions here that uh, raises two natural questions, which are the questions we ask in this paper. The first one is, what if there is no broadcast channel, but there still is an honest majority? Uh, what functionalities can be computed in this setting? And the second question is, what if there is a broadcast channel, but now there is no honest majority? So again, what can we, what can be computed securely in this setting? And these two questions uh, uh, are actually very, very hard. So in this paper, we focus only on the three party setting. So we'll have three parties and depending on the setting, we'll have either one corrupted party or two corrupted parties. So let me quickly go over our results. So for the first setting where there is no broadcast channel, uh, we provide both positive and negative results. Uh, I won't uh, go into uh, the actual results themselves. It's a bit technical. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, we do obtain a characterization of two uh, interesting families uh, of functions. The first one is where the output receiving party A doesn't obtain, uh, doesn't have an input. We provide a complete characterization for this family. And for the second family uh, that we have a characterization is where the output receiving party A may have an input, but the output is now limited to being either 0, 1, or 2. For the set setting where there is a broadcast channel, uh, and now there may be two corrupted parties, we showed that uh, actually every functionality that we have shown to be computable, securely computable in the previous setting can also be securely computable in this setting. So in particular, this means that every functionality where A doesn't have an input or where the output is either 0, 1, or 2, if it can be computed in the previous setting where there is no broadcast channel, then it can be computed in this setting where there is a broadcast channel, but no one's majority. And in fact, we can even slightly generalize the positive results and uh, this, this results in an improvement of uh, Levital's uh, paper for the free party setting. Okay, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on the no broadcast setting. So we, we assume that uh, we have three parties, only one of them obtained the output, there is no broadcast channel, and at most one party can be corrupted. So let me give you a quick overview of what we already knew. So first of all, if there is no broadcast, if there is no broadcast channel, then uh, the result of Lampard, Shostak, and Pease, they show that the broadcast functionality cannot be computed securely. Uh, second, in 2016, Cohen, Eitner, Omri, and Rotem, they considered the general multi-party setting, uh, assuming an honest majority, and they consider symmetric functionalities where all uh, parties obtain the same output, and they provide a complete characterization of this setting. Okay, so why am I telling you about these two results? Uh, these are not solitary output. However, they're both using the hexagon argument or uh, the generalization. Uh, which I'm which we're also using in this uh, paper, and I'm going to do, uh, go back to later in the talk. 
Okay, so uh, another result in a joint work with Cohen, Omri, and Suad, uh, we considered the setting where two of the parties obtain the output, and we provide the necessary and sufficient conditions for secure computation. And uh, some of the results actually do apply to the solitary output setting, however, they're not uh, that very general. And finally, Fritzi Garay, Maurer, and Ostrovsky, they uh, defined a functionality called converge cast. Uh, and they show that it implies the broadcast functionality, which means that uh, it actually implies every the, that every other functionality can be securely computed. And in particular, by the previous result of uh, that I showed on the previous slide, it means that converge cast cannot be securely computed. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about uh, our techniques. Uh, Essentially, our uh, main technique for the no broadcast setting is that we take the hexagon argument that was previously used to show the impossibility of broadcast, and we give it a somewhat of a new interpretation that will allow us to prove impossibility results for the solitary output setting. So first, to give you some background, so the hexagon argument is a technique for proving impossibility results, which was origin originally used in the distributed computing uh, literature. It was first uh, used by Fischer, Lynch, and Merritt. And like I, I told you earlier, it was used to rule out agreement where all parties output the same uh, value. And because we uh, consider solitary output setting, we don't actually care about agreement because there's nothing to agree about. What we do want, what we do care about is security. So we want the protocol to maintain several security properties such as correctness, uh, privacy, and guaranteed output delivery. And very, very roughly, the way that we show that the uh, protocol, uh, that there is no secure protocol for computing certain functions is that we will leverage in some way the correlations uh, in the views between the parties interacting in the protocol. So uh, now I'm going to give you like a pictorial proof of, uh, of the for impossibility results. I'm going to do it for the setting where the output receiving party has no input. So this is our setting. We assume that uh, there is a, a secure protocol computing this function f that depends only on two inputs, y and z. And what we're going to do is we're going to analyze this protocol and obtain uh, some necessary conditions that f must satisfy. And this is how we obtain our uh, impossibility results. So the first thing we do is consider two copies of the protocol. So these are two honest uh, copies of the protocol uh, in an honest execution. And now what we're going to do is going, we're going to reconnect the wire. So instead of having B and C prime talk to each other, we're going to let B and C prime now talk to each other. And instead of B and C talking to each other, we're letting C and B prime talk to each other. And the entire interaction here, every party acts like, uh, like an honest party would in the original three party protocol. So you can think that in some sense, we're analyzing how honest parties behave in an inconsistent system. So the inconsistent system being this hexagon protocol. And now the second observation uh, that we do is, which was also in the original hexagon argument, is that for every set of four consecutive parties, they can actually be emulated by a, a malicious adversary corrupting the appropriate party in the original three-party protocol. So for example, the, the, this set of four parties can be emulated by an adversary corrupting A, and if the honest parties B and C hold Y and Z prime respectively, then the out, then the entire interaction uh, on the left is the same as in the inter is the same interaction as in on the right. And this is where the original uh, protocol actually the original hexagon argument uh, ends. You consider other uh, for, uh, other tuples of four uh, consecutive parties, and you immediately get a contradiction. What we do is we go a step further and we somehow apply the security definition of uh, MPC. So first, we're going to only look at the output of the A on the right. So I remind you, he's an honest party. He acts like an honest A would in the original three-party protocol. So in particular, he should have an output. So this means that the adversary, that, uh, the adversary A on the left, that imagine in its head all of these four parties, it can actually ask the entire view of A. And so we can compute this output. We can generate the, an, identical, an output that is identical to whatever A outputs in the, on the six-party protocol on the right. And now what we do 
is we apply the security definition for this adversary. So we want to say that he didn't intuitively he didn't learn more than whatever the output tells him. So this can be written in a succinct way. Uh, I won't go into the full definition because we don't have the time. But it means that there exists some simulator that uh, starts with the knowledge of whatever A knew. So the knowledge is that it holds holds is the original inputs of the two parties that he imagined in its head, which is Y and Y prime and Z. But he also learns the output of uh, the output of F over the honest party's input, which is Y and Z prime. And given these three values, he should be able to the simulator should be able to output an output that is indistinguishable from whatever A outputs on the six party protocol on the right. And then what we do is that we consider this for all possible six adversaries corrupting four consecutive parties. Yeah, I won't go into all, uh, into the details because it's a bit complicated. But essentially, all of those six uh, simulators that we get should output uh, indistinguishable values because they're all correspond to the same uh, uh, the same A, the right. And so we can analyze them in some way to obtain the necessary conditions. But I won't uh, have time to go into that, so let me summarize. So we consider solitary output free party functionalities, and we had two settings. The first setting being uh, where there is no broadcast channel, but only one party may be corrupted. And we showed both positive and negative results in this setting. Uh, we don't characterize all those functionalities. There's still a gap in general between the positive and negative results. However, for the two uh, families of functionalities, well, a, the first one where A doesn't have any input, and the second one, one where he may have, might have an input, but the output is uh, restricted to being one of three values, the two results actually do provide a characterization. And for the second setting that we consider, uh, there is a broadcast channel, but now two of the parties may be co-opted. And what we've shown is that every functionality that can be compute that we've shown to be computable, securely computable in the original set, in the first setting where there is no broadcast channel can also be computed in the second setting where now there is a broadcast channel but no honest majority. Uh, this also improves the previous results of uh, a levital for the three party setting like I mentioned earlier. However, we don't know if this is part of a more general phenomenon. Namely, if I give you a secure protocol without broadcast uh, against one corruption, can we always construct a secure protocol assuming a broadcast but now we can tolerate two corruptions. And so I think this is an interesting open problem. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Okay. So let's... Let's thank Baralon and move to the next uh, talk. Again. So the next talk is about three-party secure computation with friends and foes by Baralon, Amos, Amos Beimel, and Eran Omri, and Bar will give a talk. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about uh, three-party secure computation with friends and foes. This is joint work with Amos Beimel and Eran Omri. So, this talk, I want to start with a story. This is a story of three homers. Each of the homers is holding an input. And for this uh, specific story, I want you to think of this input as a password to their bank accounts. So they're going to perform some online uh, transaction using this uh, using their uh, bank accounts. So the way they're going to do this is using a secure multi-party computation protocol. And we assume that this uh, MPC protocol can tolerate one corrupted party. So just like any other uh, MPC protocol, this one also starts with uh, the parties sharing their inputs. So the homer on the top first shares its input to Z1 and Z2 and gives it to the other two parties. But now the excited homer is getting tired. He doesn't want to participate in this uh, uh, protocol. And so he goes to bed. But from the perspective of, of the other two parties, he actually aborted. He doesn't participate in the protocol at all. And because the protocol is one secure, it, they actually continue on their own. So they finish the interaction uh, between themselves, and now each of them goes to its own way. But now this uh, sleepy Homer uh, gets up, he's a bit angry that he missed the computation, and because he didn't learn anything from the interaction, he 
can't do anything about it. But he realizes something. He realizes that he holds uh, one of the shares to the pass to the bank account, uh, to the password of the bank account of the third home. And so what he does is to send this share to the other home. And now this other home realizes that he holds two uh, shares of the uh, bank account password. And so we can now uh, use this to uh, to buy many domains. Okay, and uh, what's uh, interesting is that this is actually allowed. So according to the security definition of MPC, this uh, protocol is actually considered secure, even though one of the parties learn uh, the input of the other party. And why is that? So the reason is that the security definition states that the adversary doesn't gain more information than he should. The definition states nothing about what the honest parties learn. And because the adversary is malicious, he can send whatever messages he wants, including this Z1, which he was not supposed to send. Okay, so at this point you might say, well, this sounds true, but why can't we just solve it by considering a too secure protocol? Uh, so there are two reasons why we don't want to do this. So first of all, it might be less efficient. So uh, sometimes we can even prove that such a, that uh, dealing with uh, larger uh, security, larger uh, corruption thresholds require more rounds of interaction and maybe more uh, larger messages to send. However, this might actually even be impossible. Uh, and indeed, indeed in, the in the example of the free homers, if they want to toss a coin, then they won't be able to do this uh, against two malicious parties. And so uh, in a previous work, in a joint work with Omri and Paskin Chernyavsky, we addressed ex this exact issue and we proposed a new security definition for MPC, which we called security with friends and foes or fast security for short. Uh, basically, we want security against friends and foes alike because we want to protect honest parties from other honest parties as well. And very, very roughly, TH for security requires two properties to hold. So first, we want that standard security against T malicious parties, just like before. But now, after we fix the adversary that corrupts these two T malicious parties, we also want that for any subset of size at most H of the other uncorrupted honest parties, we want them to, uh, that they don't learn more information than they should. And this should hold even if uh, the adversary sends not prescribed messages, and even if he does it after the protocol had already terminated, like in the example I gave at the beginning of the talk, where he sent uh, the messages completely after the parties, uh, each, each of the parties went on its own way. Okay. And in the same work, we also provided the theorem which is also related to this paper. So under standard assumption, we have the following. So if 2t plus h is strictly less than the number of uh, parties participating, then we show that any uh, functionality can be computed with th for security. Conversely, if this inequality doesn't hold, then there exists some functionality that cannot be computed with th for security, and this holds even if the malicious parties are in the minority. And in particular, this also holds, you can think of the free party setting uh, where there exists a functionality that cannot be computed with one one fast security. But these two results raise a very natural question, which is the main question of this paper. So namely, if 2t plus h is at least the number of parties, which functionalities can be computed with th fast security? Can we characterize the set of functionalities that can be computed for this regime of, uh, for this regime? Okay. So just like in the previous talk, this is also a very hard question. So we limited ourselves to the special case of the free party setting. So we consider three parties and we want one one half security. So one malicious party and the other and one semi-honest party. But we also mostly consider the setting where there are only two inputs. So the first, the third, one of the parties doesn't have any. And finally, we want that all parties to obtain the same uh, output uh, uh, in contrast to the previous two talks where only one of them obtained the output. Here we want all of them to obtain the same value. And just because in the last talk we, we considered the no broadcast uh, setting, here we do assume a broadcast channel. So this is a more, uh, more standard model of computation. So uh, now I want to talk about what we've shown in this model. 
So our first result is a compiler from the two-party setting. So we showed that if you give me a secure protocol in two-party setting, and for technical reasons, we need it to be secure against both malicious and semi-honest adversaries, then we can compile it into a three-party protocol that is one one fast secure. And the reason that this is not trivial is because we also need the third party, the one that doesn't have an input, to also obtain the output. And uh, apparently it turns out that you can just let the, these two parties to just execute the original two-party protocol between themselves and let the third party knows the output. It turns out that it, it turns out that it doesn't work. And just as an example, uh, Yao's millionaire's problems where uh, we want to compute whether or not X is at least Y, it was shown to be securely computable in the two-party setting by Gordon Azai, uh, Katz, and Lindel. And so uh, our results show that it can be computed with one one for security in the three-party setting. Uh, we also provide some additional uh, positive results. So this is the result from the previous slide. Uh, but we also showed, we also consider the, the Boolean setting, the Boolean functionalities, where the output is either zero or one, and we provide several sufficient conditions for one one for security. And again, this is a complicated. Uh, this the statement is a complicated statement, so I'll only give an example. So equality uh, can be computed with one one for security, and this is not implied by any of the previous results, not the compiler or previous papers. Uh, so you might say, well, maybe everything can be computed. Maybe this is a trivial setting. So we also provide some negative results. Uh, our first uh, negative result is a lower bound on the round complexity. We show that generally speaking, we need a super logarithmic number of rounds in the security parameter to compute functionalities with uh, one one for security. And again, as an example, the equality function from the previous slide uh, also needs uh, a super logarithmic number of rounds to compute it. And finally, we also show an impossibility result. We show that if we assume one more permutation, then there exists a two input functionality that cannot be computed with one one for security. Okay, so now I want to talk about the conceptual contribution that we've made. Uh, it's called the dealer model. We basically define a simple model that is equivalent to the real model. Uh, so this means that if you give me a secure protocol in one model, I can construct a secure protocol for the same function in the other model. And we view and we use this uh, uh, dealer model to uh, to then prove all of the other results that uh, I just showed you on the other two slides. So in this model, the parties don't interact with each other, rather they interact via a trusted dealer. And the interaction in this setting is very, very limited. And in particular, uh, this also limits the adversary. So now the malicious adversary is actually a fail stop adversary, meaning that he acts honestly, but may abort prematurely. And he may also change uh, its input. But what's nice about this dealer model is that it's actually much simpler to analyze than the real than protocols in the real model, and uh, one reason is that it actually avoids implementation of cryptographic primitives. So we don't actually need the signature schemes and oblivious transfer to implement protocols in the dealer model, like, like we need, do need in the real model. And the second reason is that it turns out that the malicious adversary doesn't receive any messages in the dealer model. So intuitively, uh, this is because he only corrupts one party out of three. So he's in the minority, so we define the dealer model so that he receives no messages. And so when he decides to abort, it depends only on its input and the, uh, on, only on its input and the, uh, its randomness. And this is in contrast to similar dealer models that uh, were considered in the literature, where they were considered for standard security. And there, the adversary did receive messages from the dealer. And intuitively, this, is, this was because he, was, he corrupted a majority of the parties. So let me tell you how the dealer model uh, works. So an r -run protocol looks like this. So we have three parties, and now all of three of them uh, can have inputs. And we have a fourth party, which is the dealer, that uh, is a, a trusted party that uh, the adversary cannot corrupt. So in round zero, the three parties just send their inputs to the dealer. Then for every other round, the interaction is as follows. The dealer uh, goes to the first party and asks, uh, continue or abort. An honest party will uh, answer with continue. He then goes to the second party and uh, asks, continue or abort. An honest party will answer with continue. And finally, he goes to the third party and does the same. An honest party will ask, continue. If the third party uh, did send continue, then we move to the next round. 
And this is it. This is the entire interaction in the dealer model. At round R, the dealer tells them the output, and that's it. So the only thing that I need to tell you is what happens when there is a malicious party that actually sends a board. So let's assume that uh, the adversary corrupts the first party and he sends an abort at uh, the beginning of round I plus one. So now the dealer needs to tell the other parties their output. And this is going to be the output in, of, of the computation. But this is not uh, the only thing that the dealer sends to them because I'm reminding you that we care about FAF security here. And one of the attacks in FAF security is that the malicious adversary can broadcast its view to all of the other parties. And so we want to emulate that in the dealer model as well. And so what we do is let the dealer send some succinct version uh, of the views. So these are not uh, the actual views of an entire protocol, but these are uh, more succinct versions of it. The only bits that we actually care about, we, it turns out we can identify that. And one last thing is that both the output and the view, the succinct view that the dealer sends to the parties depends on all three inputs and the round in which the adversary decided to abort. And then we show that this uh, dealer model is equivalent to the real model. So if you give me a secure protocol in one model, I can construct a secure protocol in the other model. And uh, then we can use this deal simpler dealer model to prove, all, to prove all of our other results. So uh, let me summarize uh, this talk. So we considered a free party setting and we uh, cared about one one of security. So we've shown both positive results and negative results. For the positive results, we showed the a compiler for the from the two party setting. We showed how to compile any secure two party protocol into a one one five secure three party protocol. And we also identified a new class of Boolean functionalities that can be computed with one one five security. And for the negative results, we provide that we first provided a lower bound on the round complexity. We showed that generally we need super logarithmic number of rounds. And we showed that there exists a two party functional a three party functionality that depends on two inputs that cannot be computed with one one for security. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you again. Next, we have a soft merge of two works. One of them is Doram Revisited Maliciously Secure RAM MPC with Logarithmic Overhead by Brett Park, Daniel Noble, Rafi Ostrowski, Matan Steppel, and Jacob Zhang. And the other one is three-party secure computation for RAMs, optimal and concretely efficient by Atsunori Ichikawa, Ilan Kolmogodsky, Koki Hamada, Ryo Kikuchi, and Dai Ikarashi. And uh, Daniel and Atsuki will give the presentations. Thank you. Yes, so today I am presenting a distributed oblivious RAM or DORAM protocol that is secure against malicious adversaries. Uh, this is, in a sense, the joint first maliciously secure DORAM protocol. Atsunori, immediately after me, will be presenting another maliciously secure DORAM protocol. But prior to this, all of the DORAM protocols were in the semi honest setting. Uh, this is the joint work with Brett, Raphael. Rafi, Matan, and Jacob. So, uh, what is DORAM? I assume that the readers are, the audience is generally familiar with the MPC setting. So, there is some ideal functionality. We have a protocol that we want to use to um, simulate this, and some threshold of the entities in the protocol are corrupted. And we want to show that the behavior of the protocol will be indistinguishable from the ideal functionality. A DORAM is simply this where the MPC in question is of a RAM. So we want a secure acts, um, some kind of secure memory that is really its secret shared memory. And we want to be able to access it in secret shared locations and update it. Now, this is very useful. Uh, historically, MPC was represented in the circuit model. And 
that's um, created good generic constructions, but a lot of functionalities are not efficiently represented as circuits. It's a lot more efficient and natural to represent programs in a RAM model, and having access to a secure computation RAM allows you to do this. So concretely, if n is the number of blocks, d is the block size, and kappa is a computational security parameter, we present a protocol that has amortized communication cost of order kappa plus d log n. So this is logarithmic overhead, provided the block size is at least kappa. And we do this in the three-party honest majority setting, where, as I said, uh, one of the parties is malicious. So uh, people familiar with oblivious RAM might immediately start thinking, what are the connections between this and oblivious RAM? So in oblivious RAM, there is a single client and a single server. The client wishes to store its data on the server so that its physical access patterns on the server leak no information about its virtual access patterns. Now, it is possible to convert any ORAM into a DORAM simply by simulating the client inside of a secure computation and having one of the parties run the server. This is not the approach we're going to take today. Um, partly, this has the overhead of simulating the client, but also there's a lot of things that we can take advantage of in the multi-party setting. So we have multiple parties. They can all have significant amounts of memory. They can perform local computation, and they can communicate with each other. So there are certain things that we can do in this setting that we wouldn't be able to do just by taking an existing ORAM and compiling it into a DORAM protocol. So I'm specifically going to look at something called an oblivious hash table. I'm going to show how we can construct a DORAM using oblivious hash tables. I'll then show how we can uh, take advantage of this three-party honest majority setting to construct an oblivious hash table efficiently. And then I'll show how we can do this even if the parties are malicious. So what is an oblivious hash table? An oblivious hash table is basically, is, is very similar to a DORAM, but it has the restriction that each item can only be accessed at most once. Uh, this will seem like a very significant restriction, but I'll show that actually we can construct a DORAM from oblivious hash tables. So um, it is fairly easy, actually, to construct an oblivious hash table. So uh, if we take a normal hash table, like cuckoo hashing, and cuckoo hashing, an item is stored in one of two locations. So the number of locations that are accessed doesn't depend on the information that's been accessed. So it's already oblivious in that sense. If the hash functions are actually pseudo-random functions, then the output will be pseudo-random and therefore will not depend on the input. And so revealing the location's access doesn't reveal any information about what was queried. So we additionally need a way to construct an oblivious hash table that leaks no information about the inputs. Um, obviously, if we access the same location, query the same locations again, we'll access the same locations and this physical locations, and this reveals that we've probably queried the same item, so leaks information. So again, we have this property that each item can only be accessed once. So how can we build a DORAM from oblivious hash tables. We first store all of our items in a large oblivious hash table of size n, and then we're going to make use of a smaller DORAM of size n over 2. Each time we query an item in the oblivious hash table, we will store it in the smaller DORAM. So the smaller DORAM kind of becomes a hash. And each, um, each time we do a query, we first search for the item in the smaller DORAM. This means that uh, this, and then if we find it in the smaller DORAM, instead of querying that item in the oblivious hash table, we search access random locations in the oblivious hash table. So this preserves this required property that whenever we are querying the oblivious hash table, we're never going to query the same item twice in the oblivious hash table. Eventually, this uh, DORAM becomes full. We can build it into an oblivious hash table of size n of two. Um, clear out the, uh, the door, make the DORAM empty again. And we kind of do the same thing, storing the um, items again in the smaller DORAM before we, um, any items that we find, we store in the smaller DORAM and we query the smaller DORAM first. Um, so I've kind of shown you how to implement this, but I've shown you how to implement this assuming that a smaller DORAM exists. So how do we implement the smaller DORAM? 
we can just implement it recursively. So each DORAM has a DORAM half of its size and, and a corresponding oblivious hash table. We just continue until we end up with some DORAM that's a small base case, which we can implement using a linear scan. So uh, for those familiar with it, this is exactly the hierarchical solution, um, first proposed by Ostrovsky in the early 90s, in which there is a um, sequence of oblivious hash tables of geometrically increasing sizes. Um, I've just kind of described this approach using recursive terminal terminology, but it's exactly the same thing. So this is how we're able to um, make use of distributed of oblivious hash tables, even though they have this restriction that you can only access an item once, we can use this recursive solution to build um, DORAMs from oblivious hash tables. Now I'll show you how we can construct oblivious hash tables in the multi-party setting. Uh, so we're going to reveal all of the PRF outputs to one party, green, the builder. And this builder can now locally uh, build the hash tables in, in its head. Uh, note that this is very different from a client-server ORAMP where the hash tables have to be built in an oblivious way. Um, since the builder locally knows the permutation of items to their desired locations, the builder can create, uh, can kind of secret share this permutation. And now we secret share the data between green and pink, and green will send the first permutation to pink, and they can locally perform the permutation on their own shares. Um, just by locally moving their own data and memory. It can then be reshared between green and blue, who can locally, again, permute their shares according to um, this uh, permutation. And now we have the data secret shared according to the assignment permutation. And we can then secret share, provide this to pink and blue, who can, uh, during queries, locally access um, the relevant locations in memory. Um, so by having a single character do the building, we're able to um, make use of this uh, fact that there's an honest majority of parties. Um, so, but the problem with this is what if the builder builds it incorrectly? Um, how do we ensure that this oblivious hash table was actually built correctly? So the uh, first thing we need to check is that each item is in a valid location. We can simply do this by evaluating a PRF inside of a Boolean circuit. Uh, there are si simple, um, there are simple Boolean circuits for evaluating rating PRFs and doing equality tests. So that solves that problem. Um, the other challenge is we need to make sure that the oblivious hash table actually has all of the contents um, that we want it to have. So we can do this by constructing a polynomial where the roots are the original elements, another polynomial where the roots are the elements in the oblivious hash table, and then we need to test the equality of these polynomials, and we can do this um, by the short zipper lemma. If we evaluate the polynomials in a small number of points, if the polynomials are unequal, one of those evaluations is probably going to be unequal as well. So uh, this is how we are able to check it. But I've kind of cheated here. Um, for people who are a bit familiar with MPC, you might notice I'm using Boolean circuits on the left and arithmetic circuits on the right. And uh, these are two fundamentally different approaches in MPC. Um, in arithmetic circuits, multiplications are cheap. Boolean circuits, equalities, et cetera, are cheap. So how can I do, be doing both? Um, the answer is I choose a particular field, Z2 to the K, where actually uh, Boolean sharings, ar arithmetic sharings and Boolean sharings are equivalently, and you can swap between them for free. So thank you. Um, and we'll take any questions after the next talk. We'll, we'll move directly to the next talk. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, next talk is about uh, uh, another construction of three-party distributed ORAM. So this is a joint work with uh, Ilan Komagorovsky, Koki Hamada, Ryo Kikuchi, and Dai Karashi. And so uh, this is today's last talk. So uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, you would be tired. So please relax to attend. Okay, at first, uh, I'm starting with uh, summarize, uh, su summarize our con contribution. So the first one is uh, semi-honest construction 
uh, with uh, permutation-based oblivious hashing. A uh, unique point of that is uh, three party, uh, new three-party permutation protocol that is simple and efficient. And the second point, uh, second contribution is uh, Marisha 3 secure extension of our uh, three-party uh, semi-honest construction. Uh, that it came from uh, that comes that is comes from uh, <laughs> uh, cheating detection protocol uh, for the permutation based hashing. Uh, that it's uh, uh, that that can be batched into uh, Mac based MPC. Okay, next uh, I show a brief summary of known three party distributed forum. In the semi-honest setting, uh, there are many, many uh, schemes, but uh, I picked up uh, three constructions, that, uh, all of which has uh, uh, optimal log n communication overhead. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Lou Ostrovsky 13 uh, has a very large hidden constant, so it's uh, not uh, so concretely efficient. And the other two has a small hidden constant, but honestly, uh, ours is, uh, our hidden constant is slightly larger than Park Novo Ostrovsky 22. Instead, uh, ours has a, a slightly smaller computational overhead. On the other hand, uh, Marish, in Marisha setting, there are two schemes. The one is uh, uh, presented by Daniel. And the other is ours. Uh, these two schemes has uh, uh, independent in, uh, implementation, but uh, interestingly, uh, they has uh, uh, almost the same complexity. Okay, so uh, I will start to present our uh, our scheme. So at first. Uh, I will talk. Uh, I will show uh, notation for the secret sharing scheme, and we also uh, assume the three crews with one imposter among them. And uh, I use in this presentation a double bracket, double bracket for uh, uh, sharing among three, and a single bracket for uh, sharing between two. Also. Uh, our construction is depending on uh, role splitting technique that is used in all five schemes uh, I summarized. And uh, by this technique, uh, one party, one crew knows uh, whole, uh, so, sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, one party has a full knowledge about the hash construction, but uh, it's cannot observe the uh, lookup uh, look access pattern. On the other hand, uh, the other two parties knows about uh, the access pattern for the hash table, but uh, they cannot know about the structure of hash table. So uh, no imposter can get entire access, pat uh, entire access patterns by itself. So, uh, I will talk about our semi-honest uh, build procedure of our uh, oblivious hashing. The input is uh, key value pairs. And at first, uh, parties uh, make a hash value of hash values of uh, each key. And uh, parties open them to uh, one party. And Next, uh, P0 can compute a permutation that is a kind of sorting uh, such that uh, the pi makes uh, hash values into the hash table. Finally, uh, parties apply pi to uh, the initial input data set. Then, uh, the two parties in the, on the right side can get the uh, secret shared table. So this is the overview of and the framework of uh, our hashing. And 
Next, uh, I will talk about uh, our implementation of permutation. The input is uh, uh, share, share of two party, uh, share of the two parties, and a permutation pi. And at first, uh, in offline phase, uh, in offline phase, these two parties share uh, random values that uh, random permutation pi zero and random array uv. Uh, that it's the that has the same size, we same size as uh, d zero or d one or d two, and also uh, p zero computes the pi one uh, permutation pi one, such that uh, pi and uh, the concatenation of pi one and pi two denotes pi, and finally. Uh, P0 and P1 each sends these items to P2. Now, P1 and P2 can obtain the share of the table T, that is uh, pi D. So this is the summary of our construction of semi-honest theorem. So from permutation to the hierarch uh, hierarchical orum. And next, uh, I'm going to our maliciously secure extension of our Durham. Uh, basically, so uh, our purpose is uh, al almost achieved by using uh, generic maliciously secure MPC with Mac. Uh, that is uh, so, so this is this is because uh, the most of our construction is the uh, circuit of MC, MPC. So uh, by using Mac, uh, we can detect cheating in uh, by uh, uh, simple arithmetic operations. But uh, we have still one question: uh, How can Mac detect a cheater? Uh, who has full control over permutation. So this very strong imposter can uh, control and tamper a hash table without injuring a Mac. So here is a uh, key observation. So uh, is it true that uh, the existence of uh, the imposter who tampers the permutation is equivalent to the uh, imposter, uh, the existence of imposter who can uh, tamper a hash, hash table. It's not true. And the truth is that if there are invalid hashing, so uh, there were, there were imposter who tampered the permutation. In other words, so the uh, hash table is valid. Anyway, if the light item is in the light place, whatever the pi is. So uh, by this uh, observation, uh, we can construct a cheating detection process in the oblivious hashing. So for uh, each input uh, in hashing process, that is compute the hash value and uh, P1 computes the pi, and um, so parties uh, apply pi to in, uh, both inputs and hash values. Then uh, parties can uh, compare uh, hash values, that is uh, virtual address of items, and uh, physical address, that is public, public, public value, by, uh, sim uh, by a simple arithmetic operations. So that can be included into Mac evaluation. So uh, this is the summary of our malicious comp uh, comp uh, construction. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two very quick questions. Okay. Let's thank the speaker and all the speakers of this section then. And some announcements. And we have